All right, let's start. So welcome everybody. Uh, this is Device Shibov. <laughs> I have a few slides here. Uh, I have a few topics which I would like to discuss, but I'll be happy if you also come with some topics, if you have. Uh, we have here also second device in my tenor, Connor, uh, and <laughs> Rob is probably sleeping because it's middle of the night uh, in his case. Yeah, come on in. So what I would like to talk, uh, there is a topic of common board ID property. This come, came from Qualcomm. There's also configuration parameters. This came from NVIDIA. Maybe a few things about DT schema. And I want to also talk about the uh, usage of uh, DTS in other projects like you would. And the remaining topics are just, you know, in the case if you don't have questions, we can talk about them, but if you have questions, we will we, we'll skip them. Uh, up to you, kind of. So the common board ID property. So this, is, this came because uh, the compatibles are not enough and comparing strings is too difficult and EEPROM <laughs> is too small to store the strings. Uh, one of the solutions, I think Simon Holman mentioned it, that the fit image supports comparing strings, but it turns out that at least for the Qualcomm, they just have too many strings, too many compatibles, uh, too many different boards or small variations, right? So they have a downstream property, actually not, it's even in upstream, which are just uh, integers. Yeah, there's a question here. Uh, can you pass the mic? Okay. It's just a yeah. Go, you can store. It's just a comment. You can store device tree overlays in fit image as well. So you can have like a base DT there plus a bunch of overlays and you can have the bootloader apply the right overlays on the base DT and boot Linux with that. This is actually what we do because we have uh, a baseboard with like billion variations. It's logistically impossible to support or to actually have billion device trees in a fit image. But how so do you select the uh, overlays? How do you apply them? How do you choose which overlay? We, we actually have a U-boot script which detects which board it is and then selects the combination of base DT plus the overlays which we need. Uh, the fit image can actually embed the U-boot script and run that. So if you then have more variations, mm -hmm. you can just replace the fit image, including the script, and cover all the billion plus one variations. Mm -hmm. We did the same, nothing new. I'm just saying, yeah, it's all figured yeah. out. There's no register to read the ship set revision? Uh, so maybe Bjorn knows exactly the hardware in the case of Qualcomm. So we can figure out the SOC, but then there is, uh, yeah, well, PCB variations and there will be peripheral variations with the customers. Uh, there might be second source components. So, so it be becomes multiple layers of selection mechanisms. And uh, uh, I mean, the current scheme of having these three integers scales, has scaled well for Qualcomm, but not for Qualcomm's customers. So there is, uh, uh, I mean, we are incentivized to, to come up with a more generic scheme there as well. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, it, it must almost have almost worked. So yeah, a few months or uh, about a year ago, we dropped the uh, really long compatible schema from the Qcom SOC. But uh, I think that uh, yeah, which which encoded all, all different PMIC and all this stuff. But I think this can work as a schema for fit image compatibles, if extended. So it, it does not work for the kernel, it is not necessary for the kernel, but this can work for the fit image. So I support fit image. And uh, earlier, I think uh, we discussed if we can embed fit, uh, if we can get uh, fit image wrapped into the PE and then make not only uh, U boot people happy, but also the UFI people happy. Yeah, that sounds good. We just need an executable header or something. Um, there's a, some of you maybe have found the fit spec at Open Source Firmware Foundation or something. Um, so a PR would be great. Uh, that includes 
that spec includes things like SKU-ID and something else. Um, so it can certainly be extended to add more things. But what worries me about the uh, combinatorial thing, you know, I've, I saw comments about there might be a billion different combinations. Um, it's not so much the number of axes that you might imagine, it's how many actual things there are. Some of those things could be just, uh, you know, <clears throat> there might be two different PMICs, so that can have two different nodes or two different compatibles for the PMIC. You don't necessarily have to put that in the top level compatible. Um, so so I, I think, you know, from my perspective, the, the fit compatible thing works super well. Uh, it would be a shame to, um, to throw it away. The proposal here is quite flexible, so uh, they want some sort of viable IDs for both of the SOC and the board or the components, and it's quite extensible up to different revisions, and the list can grow, and the selections allow quite a flexibility. However, still, of course, the question if everyone says, yeah, we use the fit image and compatible matching, then <laughs> this might be the answer. Uh, if there are more users, it would be easier for the guys because that's the answer from the team maintainers. Got, please get one more user. Uh, there's that. Uh, we have something similar on our board. I mean, we have this usual uh, ID with uh, product variant, hardware revision. What? We see that I'm not sure if it would be covered here, that might be covered with a script, is that normally we have uh, one DTB file that is compatible with multiple board ID or revision ID. That's because the differences are relevant for, let's say, the hardware, the actual PCB, but maybe not relevant you know, for the description that we have. Not sure if this would be covered with some sort of list or we would have ended up having DTSI and you know, 10 files just redefining this. Uh, ID property. All right, so if there's any other user for this, please come up. If not, the answer will be fit image. But the, with a fit image, then we store the selection criteria outside the DT, yeah. right? Yeah. I think that was one of the uh, issues that Elliot brought up was that we don't want something external of the device tree to actually map a compatible string to one or more device tree blobs and overlays. Hard to maintain. And maybe not accepted in this kernel. <laughs> it would be something like a YAML file or something under the device tree file. So technically, the fit image is a device tree itself. So the fit image is basically a device tree with long strings encoded in it, and the long strings are the blobs which you encode in, in the fit image. It just uses the ink bin directive of the DT compiler. So it's like a super device tree, effectively, which embeds device trees and overlays and the kernel image. There would have to be a description for the fit image format, which has been long established anyway. But the selection criteria you have into the boot script, so everybody's inventing their own boot script. and its own selection criteria. So this is board specific anyway. <coughs> yeah, it's fine. Yeah. I mean, the board selection criteria are hardware specific anyway. Okay, folks, uh, let's move on. Uh, one idea was from, uh, from NVIDIA, I believe. So they want to have some sort of configuration parameters which uh, are stored per, let's say, SOC, so in DTSI, but they are selected based on the board properties somehow. So uh, they describe them as the timings, but they also mentioned that it could be more than only the timings. Uh, they look somehow like that. So, oh, this is the cover letter that 
this could be some functional speed <coughs> of some bus, uh, IO controllers, or some uh, signal timings, board characteristics, thermal characteristics. And they propose some sort of DTS looking like this. So this would be the configuration for the I2C, and depending on the speed of the I2C bus or some pin control settings, right, you choose this fast configuration or the standard configuration. Uh, is this any of interest for other SOCs? Because here as well, we kind of look for second user or, yeah, or this would be just come on, use standard properties or fit yourself. Yeah, we used to have this. And then uh, Rob said no. So it never <laughs> went upstream. <laughs> All right, then uh, in that case, they should reach to you and maybe uh, you will be able to convince Rob together. But do you still use it downstream or not? I believe there is some cases where we need to tweak uh, more than just uh, the frequency of, uh, of an I2C bus, for example. Yeah. The, uh, behind there are some... Uh... Does it make sense to change this on a bot-by-bot -bot basis or do you just have these two settings for the frequencies? Because like for FIs, you have similar uh, properties where you uh, set the skews for the different lines so you have the angle that you need between the signals and there you change it on a bot by bot basis because it's layout dependent. I'm not sure about I2C if, you, if it's also something that's bot dependent or just frequency dependent. So if it's frequency dependent it should go into the driver I think. So I imagine that this is also board dependent. Okay, thank you. Whoa. Yeah, so there are actually two different cases here. On the previous slide, you also mentioned uh, fused values. If the yeah. values are fused, then I don't see a reason to put it in the DTS. Yes. <laughs> and for the other parameters uh, on the next slide, so you basically have two different configurations there, and then you need some way to select. Or yeah, I would need to which is show specific. entire source code. I mean, uh, that's another point that I cannot here display show everything, right? Because this is, I think, limited way. Mm, so I just abstracted some piece that the point of view that you just have multiple different configurations per different devices. So the this I2C has some sort of fast mode and the standard mode. And this is devi defined per SOC basically. So the different boards will choose different setup. Okay, so this is different from uh, calibration values. Because for this you could just put some uh Binary property in DT, well, with, which is basically some yeah. list of bytes, which is similar to what you would put in a fuse. Yes, uh, I mean it's, get, it's getting similar to, the, to this uh, point, but the, few, the binary values or the fuse values are quite not user readable, and I guess this is the point. Yeah, that's more it. readable, but it takes much more space. Yes, yeah. And fuse values, they're binary usually too. True. Um, so yeah, so this is basically, I'm, I work for NVIDIA, so we, we've been trying to, I was actually meaning to talk to you guys about this, because uh, we, we really want to solve this problem. I hear this quite a lot, and, and we want to find a way how we can upstream it. And one of the things that we had considered was having a binary re representation for this. Um, but you know, there's been proposals for this in the past as well, and they have never been accepted. And there were like, you know, things like address and register, register address and value proposals and that kind of thing. So we're just trying to find a way how we can make this work in, in some way. And if it's a binary representation, that would probably work fine too. Um, we just have to agree on something. Can you maybe explain why you need this? Oh. Yeah, so the idea is that you have, like in I2C, you have these different bus speeds, and depending on the bus speed, you have to program different values into the register, and some of these are not directly rated. Like, you cannot derive them from the frequency directly. They are like uh, hand-tuned values that you have to write into those registers or register fields. And, and so, there's a, as I understand it, there's a whole process where they qualify these values during chip bring-up, and then they come up with these tables and they, they're expected to, to end up in these registers to work properly. Um, yeah. There are questions behind. Uh, sure. We use the same thing for MMC, 
for ex example, where the tap delay is de described at DDR50, how the timing looks like. Right now, the way that we have done that is to put it as part of the MMC node, and these are properties within the MMC node. But are they describing the hardware? They're not. They're actually describing the configuration parameters of the hardware. Pulling that out as a separate config no property itself will be very useful. It'll be very clean uh, to understand, understand as well. So. Uh, if I see this property cor correctly, there's, uh, for example, clock divisor and so on. Uh, what will happen if I use uh, uh, device tree to configure uh, some nodes for some specific clock, but it's not compatible to uh, configuration profile which is used? So yeah, the, the idea is that the driver would have to coordinate between, so you, you get the frequency from typically your, your, um, your device, your I2C uh, chip is configured with the, the frequency. And the idea is that basically you would switch that mode, you have the, the clock frequency of your block, and then you, you select the corresponding configuration for it. And there's perhaps some of these we could perhaps um, abstract in the, uh, like via a clock, some sort of clock that we expose, but not for all of them. Um, so, but, so that, yeah, then there needs to be software that coordinates between the actual clock, the frequency that is selected or required by the device, and and selecting these options. Yeah. So, uh, the I score C may be not the best example because for I score C, uh, it is not per device. You have the clock fre fre clock frequency set by the bus or for the bus. So you can derive most of those parameters from the bus clock frequency, and you have to program it really once. And uh, what, well, we had this kind of situation, not with the SCRC, but with uh, USB, <coughs> the USB files especially. And we, uh, yeah, our engineers from Qualcomm tried to upstream different ideas, but we ended up with really just having the uh, device-specific parameters telling that, yeah, fine-tune this named register to this value, so it tells us QCOM uh, something tune equal this parameter. And more importantly, <coughs> it's not a binary value. So on the right side, it's what's period? Is it seconds? Is it milliseconds? Is it microseconds? So we ended up, uh, well, and we ended up insisting that the values there are either enumerated strings or they are just some, uh, some kind of unit values. So please don't add raw register values into the device tree, because then for anybody else coming who does not have jetson.pdf or, I don't know, tigro.pdf, it is impossible to understand what's going on. So... Yeah, th this is, I2C is just an example. We have this for, we need this um, for, for very different, like SPI and MMC, that kind yeah. of thing. So so some of this you cannot generate out of actual algorithms because you do characterization over uh, PVT corners and you know temperature corners, etc. Uh, so it's not an exact science for us to put a timing value and be able to figure out what the register value looks like. MMC and probably many other interfaces are a candidate for that. As I said, yeah, the, uh, you have the base clock frequency, and that uh, from that you can derive some of those. But uh, if you have anything to override that, or if you have anything to specify the exact register value, then you also should use uh, sensible values, not raw values. So that's that was my point. So uh, if it is programmed in milliseconds, and if it can be one, three, and ten, then the device tree should say one. Oh, something msec. Yeah, yeah, and that's one, ten, and three, and this is this should be enumerated. Okay, guys, maybe last question around here, and we we'll move further. So my understanding is that often this stuff is just stuffed into the driver, as like tables of data. I see that a lot. Yeah, we can. Yeah, usually like this. Can we do that? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that, but I'm just, I just like to compare it with pin control. For example, we have tons of data, and we put up with that, which, um, you know, I'd like, 
I'd like to get that data into the device tree, actually. Anyway. So, folks, uh, I don't want to interrupt the executive discussion, but I also have a few other topics to, to cover. And the slides are available, and um, they're attached to the, to the uh, LPC event, I mean, to the session. So, you can also find the, the LKML discussion there or original thread and, uh, and join there or just try it. Because I would like to also mention the, let me press, yeah, uh, something which maybe you have concerns. So, DT schema is quite tricky sometimes to use, and we know that, for example, the error reports are quite uh, convoluted. Uh, and maybe you have other topics what could be improved, and just a caveat here that whatever you propose, maybe there's someone who will implement it as well. Um, but are there any topics of concerns when you work with the schema and the bindings? Maybe more examples? I don't know. <coughs> the uh, performance of uh, DT Validate is uh, not at all what it needs to be. This improved a uh, few months ago, and it, the uh, DT binding check improved significantly. And Rob was saying that with the update to new JSON, it then decreased significantly. Uh, new JSON schema. schema. So, yeah, we are back to the previous stuff, but I understand. So, anyone wants to rewrite it in Rust? <laughs> <laughs> I'm supportive of that idea. <laughs> but, uh... <laughs> Sorry, this is ancient history. But uh, in Chrome OS, we had a uh, validator for, for this written in Python, and I did actually, prov it uses the DTB. I did actually um, show this, I think, to a couple of people many years ago when they were starting that up, and they said, no, no, we don't want that. But it was super fast. So, um, you know, the reason I don't like the JSON validator is it's, it's, it's error messages are just, it's like C++ times 10. So we do have a proprietary JSON format for another project, and there's a schema validator for that as well. Uh, we had a similar challenge in terms of what a DTE validator is facing. The solution that we had done in our validator was to create a threaded solution, um, but it is a little involved, doesn't work on all operating systems, which is an option, if that is interesting. Um, if the community is interested, we can put a couple of our upcoming interns in future on the project, if that's interesting. Yeah, I think uh, what, what can be improved too is, um, you know, when we have uh, uh, blah, 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 yes, blah, 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 cells three, impose a const three, uh, there is no description of what we have to put as argument when we use the piano. We know that we have to put three integers, but what are they? <coughs> some inter for, uh, for interrupts, for instance, we have some <coughs> standard properties, the, the interrupt line, if it is a rising or falling edge, but from other, uh, other part, we really don't know what we have to put as uh, the parameter, so maybe <clears throat> where the dash blah 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 cells is defined, we can have also the description, the exact parameters we have to put. Uh, so for the case of the p-handle array, so yeah. the, the p-handle which takes the arguments, we exactly. usually ask to describe it, and then you have a syntax where you have the items, and you list the items and description. One is the p-handle, second description is, I don't know, some uh, phi mode, and the third one is register, offset, whatever. So at least for the syscon-like handles, we really enforce it and ask for it. Uh, and for the other cases, I think because we ask, so maybe just the contributors should do it. Yeah, like I think most of the standard ones, like things like PWM cells and all those, they're like defined <laughs> in the, like, either in like DT schema itself or in some, um, common schema in the kernel, and they're not described in any of the actual controllers that have the property in them. So, like, yeah, PDM cells, clock cells, all of those ones, those are never described, even if the, the syscon ones are, so. 
Does anyone would benefit from more examples uh, in the kernel, how to write some certain things? <coughs> I don't know, raise your hand if you like more examples. Okay, a few hands, so not that terrible idea. Uh, question? Comment. Comment. Yeah, uh, I think it was told already several times, can we have some HTML representation of, the, of schemas that we can point people to? That would be really nice and... It's doable. Uh, you can create big PDF out of it. <laughs> Someone has to, yeah. And Christoph, for every c review comment that you give, can we convert that into an example? <laughs> every. <laughs> there's, there's quite a few patterns that we see. Well, we can do a few of them, sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the wish list is over. Uh, I hope that everyone knows that the Linux kernel DTS is now used outside of the Linux kernel. So just in case if you don't know, the U-Boot took it some time ago. Uh, so this was work of uh, Sumit Garg. And it's already released in the U-Boot. So several platforms in the U-Boot take exactly the import the DTS from the kernel. It uh, doesn't mean that every board from that platform uses the upstream, because for example, the, in the case of Samsung, there's only just one board using upstream, and a few others just use still the U-boot one style. But I think for the Qualcomm, we switch to everything, so all boards use the upstream uh, DTS. And what does it mean for the Linux kernel? So I was also proposing that time that we should have maybe a maintainer's profile entry to kind of that each of the SOC which has such kind of external user of DTS should know that oh, you cannot break the ABI that easily. I don't know, maybe other ideas, uh, how to make the SOC maintainers aware that the AB, break or AB impacts would be different. A comment. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, just a comment regarding uh, people using DTS3. Uh, I remember a patch set from OpenBSD. Uh, people trying to add a device tree, and uh, after one or two attempts, to, uh, giving up and saying, oh, that's too hard, we'll just stay with our patches. So maybe this can also be included into something that we can improve, because we have our own ways of thinking of and doing in Linux community, but people coming from other sources or from other projects have different expectations and different practices, so we should be more open to them. That's actually one of my next slides, that <laughs> we might be accepting the DTS uh, in the Linux kernel where there's no Linux kernel user of this DTS. And uh, this might create weird feeling of people that we support that hardware in the Linux kernel, while that's not true, because no one ever booted Linux kernel with this hardware. Michal? We are probably, um, so I'm planning on attempting to do the same thing for Zephyr. Uh, in the, well, try and use the device tree in Zephyr. Try and get them to use the same binding. At least for my boards. Wow, that's uh, a, I'm, that's I'm going deep. to attempt. I'm not, going to, I'm not saying that I'll succeed. Uh, the thought philosophy in Zephyr is dramatically different. Uh, I realize that. Uh, the intent is to find where the deltas are. Um, because there's a lot of uh, software configuration parameter that they do use in uh, device tree in Zephyr. Um, the challenge is going to be, at that point, what, are we, what is the kernel community willing to give and what we will adamantly stand against. So this is something that will be very interesting to see. So um, I've probably said this before, but U-Boot stores some configuration in the device tree and needs to, and I wish that were allowed um, in the bindings. Zephyr absolutely does. Um, and the reason, I mean, I was discussing this with them years ago when, when I was trying to get Zephyr um, in, in Chromebooks, that, uh, you know, why they didn't use the, ups, you know, the uh, Linux thing, and they basically said, no, it's impossible. They, you know, it's just too mu too much friction. We'll never get it off the ground. It'll never happen. So there would be need. There would need to be some give, and I think that's yeah. that's not something I've seen enough of uh, myself personally.
Oh, I can't throw that far. Throw well. this. Yeah, I, th I think one concern, go back on the, the, a little bit on the previous slide, one concern that, that we've run into is it's not always obvious when the device tree is binding change is causing an ABI break for other platforms. So I'm wondering if like maybe there could be something added to DT schema or some other automated tooling that would say, hey, you added a required property, just you know, be aware this is, a, this is an ABI break, is, you know, so we can automatically flag this sort of change to know when we might need input from uh, projects that are affected by it. I mean, it's tricky to make it automatic because uh, if, when the platform is new, you are allowed to easily, if there are no users, you are allowed to, to, to change it, right? Add any required property. And that touches on a similar topic, which is while we are bringing up a new device or platform, it would be nice to have uh, some common marker for say, this is experimental and we have not yet entered a phase where we guarantee that we, we have settled ABI. Uh, beyond that, uh, for me, uh, I consider the device tree in the kernel to be a convenience because most of the users are there, but, but I still think that the device tree should be seen as a separate project from the kernel. Okay. Uh, and then another uh, issue that's, that's when we start using device trees, the same device trees in various other projects outside Linux is we might have issues where we have like the same, multiple device trees showing different views of the same hardware from like different, like, you know, from the Linux capable CPU versus the microcontroller in the same SOC and like, how do we, like, is it okay to have multiple device trees for the same SOC from different views and how do we keep those straight? So this is the uh, system device trees and I think this is already handled by the, by the looper. Uh, so you have the device trees of device trees basically. But do you really want the system device tree in the... Uh, they're not in the Linux kernel, right? Yeah. You, you, mean, you mean that we can have the same hardware, really DTS for the same hardware from different point of view, or there are different parts of the hardware? Because usually CPU and, I mean, the application process and MCU are different. The, the hardware will look, might, or is in many cases, it looks different from the different execution environments. And hence the DT should look different. Yeah. Yeah, so, so I guess the question is, should we, should we then fall back to the system device tree and, and figure out how to make that work, or should we accept storing the different views of the world from the different uh, execution environments? Right, and if we're using something like system device tree, are we, are we gonna start putting system device tree in the Linux Git repository? Because this is sort of the, this, if we're using this for all the different projects, this is the source of truth for, for the system you know, as a whole device tree, right? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, so going back to the stability problem, uh, so Bearbox has been using the upstream device tree since it was first, yeah, since it has device tree support, so like, I don't know, ten, eight years, 10 years, and it breaks all the time, and it's not for new platforms, it's for old platforms. Uh, sorry, but the TI guys really like to change their device tree all the time. A simple bus <laughs> needs to become a simple PM bus, a network driver, okay, we add a new network driver with a new compatible, switch it around, and all the time it keeps breaking. And I would really love that, uh, yeah, someone enforces the compatibility of being able to boot an old Linux with a new device tree or like an old bear box with a new device tree. But yeah, all the focus is on a new kernel being able to boot an old device tree and never the other way around. So I really like that you would also now does it for some boards. So it breaks more, more people and there is some pushback because it's, I have no statistics, but I think it might be half the regressions we have in Bearbox are device tree related. No, that because, sounds bad. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, it's uh, every sync. Uh, so we sync with every RC, every kernel RC, and it keeps breaking all the time for yeah, for various reasons. So the ball goes to TI. <laughs> <laughs> So
So yes, we did break uh, backward compatibility in a few instances, uh, but only when we are forced to. Uh, the <laughs> I would have, sorry? Yeah, so yes, the things have settled down at the moment, but again, this is about, um, the, there's a philosophy that we have saying that DT is completely an ABI, and there is another philosophy that assumes that DT is something of a hardware description whose definition we learn over time. So this is a constant conflict that we all have, right? Uh, now, what's the right balance for it is that if, we, if I knew, for example, Bearbox was using the system device tree, I mean, the kernel device trees, I would have been testing that as well. Today, I test both the U-boot changes uh, and the kernel changes, and I do test backward and forward compatibility, in my testing at least. So if you're seeing specific instances, let me know. Um, you can look up the maintenance file for my name. Uh, or any of the uh, TI guys know, we'll take care of it. On this topic, uh, one recent example from a TI platform, just by chance. <laughs> <laughs> the PCIe driver for the newer platform is implementing the uh, reset of the PCIe with the wrong polarity. So after the probe, they assert the reset instead of releasing it. Solution, the device three are defining the polarity of the GPIO inverted, okay? Now, I personally spent two days on that because it was a bring up of the new hardware, so I <laughs> blamed all of you guys. <laughs> And <laughs> now, what should we do? I mean, uh, I pushed a patch, uh, you know, for changing the device tree and the driver, okay? And this is going to be an ABI change, okay? that's clear. I mean, I'm changing the logic. And not sure what to, how to move forward. I mean, I am fine because now I know <laughs> this. So DTS should be here correct, right? <laughs> and it's just the Linux was buggy. The, the Linux drivers uh, did not respect the polarity, or you changed in this in the DTS? Both were wrong. Both were wrong. I mean, it's working, so the driver is driving the GPIO the inverted way, so uh, asserting the reset when you should release it. And to make it work, who did the device three just defined in the polarity of the GPIO like there was a knot in between, okay? But there is no knot in yeah. the hardware, believe me. <laughs> yeah, there's a common uh, issue in, in the drivers. <coughs> This is something that can be solved with just better documentation of the bindings so you didn't spend days investigating why it was backwards or like, I guess the question is like, how accurate does the device tree have to be compared to what is the requirement for stability? Is it, that's, that's your question, right? I mean, the problem becomes if you're sharing that driver with future platforms because you don't want to inherit that problem. Otherwise we could just ignore it, just state that this DT is wrong and it matches the driver. But then when the next platform comes, you don't want to inherit that inverted bit, so all future ones will have to be incorrectly described. Um, but I mean, the way we do that on the Qualcomm side is that we, we get together and we sort of negotiate what's the risk here of, or what's the cost of, of breaking this thing. And uh, yeah, uh, as long as we're mostly in Linux, I mean, it's fairly easy to get the community. But uh, yeah, uh, the, the further the DT spreads, the, the bigger of the issue that would be become. There was a question behind. Uh, I just wanted to mention there was, uh, when there was this discussion about bot IDs and so on, we talked about backwards compatibility and Rob mentioned that he had, that he's working on a tool that inject in, uh, in your digests uh, device trees, changes, so the old device trees, the new device tree and the bindings and tries to flag stuff that might be, uh, yeah, breaks the compatibility of um, old kernel or bootloader with the new device tree. On the Bearbox side, we have also been working on something like this. So DTC now has support for minus big L, I think, uh, capital L, I think. It adds uh, local fix ups. So you can have P handles in the device trees. And the idea is that we, when we have the P handle information in the device tree blob, we can more easily 
do a diff over the device tree blobs, detect every all changes when we do an update, and then we don't match against the bindings, but we try somehow to find out which properties are Bearbox matching against and which compatibles, and then we flag it for manual review. Because a lot of stuff is, okay, we are matching against this device tree node, but now it has another compatible, or we were, uh, or something like um, a quirk has been moved, uh, you add a new quirk, uh, property with a new name, which is a superset of the old Quirk property, but the old Quirk property goes away. So this breaks a USB driver, for example, and that stuff would turn up in such a diff. So I really think we need better tooling support to be able to detect these breakages. Uh, yeah, nice talks. Uh, we still have five minutes. So, by the way, are there any? Uh, Unrated questions, there's something. Where? <laughs> Just a really quick comment. Um, I do want, I think some words should be send, uh, said in defense of ABI breaks. Um, if you have a really hard policy of never ever being able to do it, it does create potentially a lot of code and a lot of problems. Um, as well. It does. I can still go for my slides, or if you guys want to ask something that I have. Oh, there's. Yeah, short question related to your U boot and OpenBSD and all this. Uh, so, is it a time to think about? Uh, Moving, yeah, I see a smile. Moving device trees and maybe the schema out of the kernel tree. Mm -hmm. So the answer is as you read because some people bring it for a long time. For the bindings, uh, no, because if you move the bindings outside of the kernel, you lose the exposure on the review. So no one will be looking there. And we need the biggest amount of eyes from the, let's say, people from the subsystems to look to review the the binding. So the bindings should stay where the most eyes are looking, which is the current. Now about the DTS, uh, this could work. Uh, on the other hand, we already ex export the DTS. There's a repository which has all the DTS dumped per ke every kernel release. So now the question whether you want to move the development there. Or maybe still it's better to have the development with the most eyes. Will you be looking at different projects to perform reviews on DTS? Oh, if it ends up on the same mailing list, then why no? So but that's maybe a question not to you, but to the uh, SOC maintainers. Yeah, that's a point. Yeah. Oh, there is an yeah. SOC maintainer there. <laughs> so we, we've discussed this many times, and we've tried many times. Um, so far, we've always failed, um, because like I, I, at some point, I had another tree on devicetree.org. Um, well, that I think didn't get used much, and I lost interest in, in maintaining it because the people that asked for it didn't need it anymore, and uh, yeah, it died down. So we had the plan to move it. Um, I don't see a, a, a strong reason to try again at this point. I think what we have is working well enough. If there were major problems with it, we could move it. Um, the only problem was this OpenBSD person who, I don't remember the name, who tried to upstream a patch and who failed because we are way too strict for them. Yes, and th there will always be problems whichever way we go. I'm, uh, maybe we should have been more welcoming. I, I don't know. It's yeah. That's fair. Uh, if my add my two pennies to the uh, comment regarding moving out the DTS out of the tree, there are several reasons to not to do that because, first of all, uh, this is a very good tool to remove the rotten code, right? If there are platforms which are not supporting or not following with the DTS, they are finally removed from the kernel. So if you move it outside of the kernel, then nobody would care. This is one comment. Second comment is that this is a very good motivation for the customers to upstream their boards because they must be in the Linux kernel, because they need to be reviewed by many people, etc. If you have a separate project, just dump it. Maybe some people would uh, look on that or not, but you will 
uh, have two parallel uh, development ways for kernel, kernel drivers and then matching device tree. Okay, so um, quick comments regarding the um, device tree um, definitions which are uh, device tree document bindings and device tree source files. Um, just a week ago on the K-Summit um, kernel mailing list, um, I have discussed this with Rob and Connor. Um, so there are some great points um, pointed out there. So if you're interested in the details and what is going to happen, I also want to modify the documentation uh, on the device tree and what it is about. Um, is it going to be the device tree repository? Um, but the Rob's point was exactly what we already said here. Um, a lot of kernel drivers, they wouldn't be bothered to um, work with another repository, so it should stay on a Linux uh, repository. But um, I still want to push for um, complete anonymity, um, autonomy, excuse me, auto autonomy of device tree document bindings. Um, so yeah, um, re please read the uh, document. Please read the communication um, on the mailing list, case summit, uh, for what was discussed because there are great points made there. Uh, and with this, we are actually past the time. So <laughs> sorry, Bjorn, <laughs> uh, because the next session should start. So thank you very much for coming. I'll be over here. So.